Uh, so welcome, thank you for coming. Um, uh, so what, what has happened is uh, um, we three that you're about to see have got together um, and had a look at our talks. Um, and what we've decided to do is kind of um, pull them all together and have a look at some of the overlapping themes. And so we are actually going to introduce ourselves and then we're also going to introduce our projects. Uh, but what we really want to do is to cater the, the whole discussion to what it is that you guys want to know about those particular projects and all of the theories that kind of bind them all together. So we've got a whole bunch that we're going to kind of show up on the screen. There's far more than an hour and a half's worth of content by a good two or three hours. So it's going to be up to you what we do. And after telling you all to sit where you're sitting, we may not even get to that game, for example. Game. We, want, we want that to happen, but it depends on where you guys lead us. So first of all, um, we're going to just quickly introduce ourselves. Um, so I'll start. My name is Ben Tuhoi Kenobi. Um, my name wasn't always Kenobi. I changed it as a bit of a lark. We can talk about that later at the St. James Restaurant. Um, I am a lecturer at AUT University, um, and I'm also a, an active member of the uh, Auckland and the New Zealand Game Developers community. I run uh, some events such as the Auckland Game Developers Meetup, which happens every month in Auckland. Uh, and that's kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, if you want to connect with, just come and say hi and I'll, I'll tell you how to get your students along and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I also run a 48 hour game jam every year called Kiwi Jam. And again, that is a good way to in introduce people into uh, the community. I also um, I direct a uh, play interactivity and games research lab at AUT called Pigsty. Uh, and this is my final week of three years serving on the New Zealand Game Developers Association board. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good Hi, my name is Richard Durham. I'm a recovering science teacher come learning designer uh, over at Unitech up in Auckland, uh, which means I basically work with lecturers to help them design their courses and try to, for me, put a lot of play-based activities or play-based sensibilities to, to the way the courses are designed. Um, I also work with Wild Streets up in Auckland, which is a, an org uh, that's a given, but it, it is a festival of games, of street games. So we, we organize uh, festivals, particularly in the summertime, where families and kids come out to play uh, with each other in real space, um, using modern design sensibilities for a lot of the games. Although, after seeing Harko's talk this morning, we really want to take some back with us and try to do some more indigenous games as well, because that'd be awesome. Uh, we also, with Wild Streets, do a lot of uh, ideation sessions with people, such as at Kiwi Jam, we work with uh, groups to teach them about game design and game design philosophy. Um, same with GameArtisans.nz or Game Artisans New Zealand. Um, I'm an organizer for that, which is, uh, if you love board games, uh, this, this is your people, uh, your, your tribe. We look at prototyping games and we support each other, all the New Zealand game developers and game designers that work on physical games and trying to get them published. And so we meet up to test those together. And uh, Wonder Tree Studios is just my personal consultancy to build games for social good organizations around the world. Richard does a disgusting amount of play design, prototyping, and playtesting sessions. It's crazy. Yes, my wife tells us, yeah, it's a disgusting yeah, amount yeah. of time spent <laughs> playtesting. Um, kia ora koutou. My name is Diana Grace Morris, and you might know me as DG. I just bring it down to thing. Um, and um, this year I'm a lecturer at AUT University in the School of Education, working with pre-service teachers. Um, and before that, I was actually a um, classroom teacher and DP down here in Wellington at Ridgeway School. Um, I am also up at, um, as part of a lecturer up at AUT, I'm also um, connected with Edgework, which is a um, futures-focused um, network of um, educators um, at AUT. And there's um, a couple of members here. Um, here, um, and also um, I'm on Twitter from Diana Grace NZ. There are two hashtags there: Gameful Praxis, and that is um, where Rachel, Dan, Leanne, where are you? And I, we got together and we just thought, okay, so how can we actually make games real in the classroom? What do we? What does it actually look, sound, and feel like? So we, I probably should have put that website up there too. But if you follow that hashtag. And also I'm a member of Welly Ed, and I actually think there's Welly Ed people actually in here, because I've seen some faces. And it's a community of educators um, working on collaborating around resources and around um, pedagogical practice and you know, connecting each other. Um, and what's actually happened for myself up here in AUT is that the game design work that I did at my school, I'm now taking that and using it with the pre-service teachers. Yeah, so that's... All right, well, I'm nice. Hey. Um, 
So we want the format as much as possible to be a, a back and forth. Now, we, as I say, we've got a lot of content, but we have very early on recognized that uh, we are not the absolute expert of experts in these fields because a lot of what we're doing is relatively new territory. So we are not just encouraging, but almost imploring for you to interject um, if you have anything that you would like us to um, expand on, or if you've got anything that maybe um, we could you know, use to take back to our own practices, and even to counter what it is that we're talking about. We are going to be going, it's going to be warts and all, it's a critical discussion, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's just failures, okay? And if you've got any way to solve that, please let us know. Um, we thought of maybe some sort of way to put your hand up um, <laughs> to, grab to, to grab our attention. We are likely to just babble on about the things that we're talking about. So yeah. to draw untoward attention to yourself, just double clap and raise your hand like this. <laughs> the yeah. statico nature will really get our attention. Okay. And so the, the first three slides we'll try and breeze through, which are the discussions that are in the blurb. Uh, but then after that, and there's a lot of stuff that's in those that we can expand upon later. And then after that, if you just want to go, hey, can you talk more about that? Then please do. Don't feel that you have to do that, but we are here to discuss. But I'm going to make you do it now, just for practice. Okay. You got so, it. It's pro, right? You okay. it's, it's, oh, cool. All right. So, um, so yeah. So this is this is our talks. I guess I think I'm first. Are you, are you first? You're first. Am I first? first? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so Suburban Quilt, um, a street game about bees, uh, was a project that started as a third year, first semester university student uh, project um, at AUT by a student named Sophie Hansen, who you can see pictured in the second to top left picture up there. Um, and what I'm going to do is give you a brief overview of the way that that um, project was scaffolded into the learning environment. Um, and the, the point, one big thing I wanted to to actually do before we started this oh. is ask who you are oh. so that we can point the information in the right direction. Right. So um, can I please get um, just some, an indication, hands up if you are a teacher. Almost all of you. All right, but put your hands down okay. if you're, oh, back, 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 back. Put, your, put your hand down if you're a primary teacher. Awesome. Oh, really? Awesome. So, so then what, intermediate? <laughs> High school? <laughs> Higher than high school? Tertiary, yeah. Okay. Tertiary, yeah. Right. Tertiary. Okay. Uh. So, so the interesting thing is a lot of my work is done at the university level. So mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see and hear from you guys what is um, the potential kind of difficulties with transposing some of these scaffolding techniques into your um, environment. So I'm going to talk about how this works in the university environment. So to start off with, this was done out of Art and Design, the School of Art and Design. Uh, and what they have at Art and Design is several majors. So you've got spatial design, digital design, uh, uh, product, fashion, and so on and so forth. But then the students can also choose what's called a minor. And in the minor, they can um, choose something that's a little bit different from their major. And so for example, as in Sophie's case, you can be, uh, what did she do again? Oh, she, so she was in um, communication design, so a graphic designer. Um, her sensibilities were around illustration. And she took the game and play design minor. And it's a small part of the, of the learning journey um, that's supposed to inform their practice in their major. This project is done in the first semester of their final year, so it's before their final semester. To start off with, in this particular case, um, Sophie and, and, her, and her classmates learned about uh, things like mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, culture of play, all that sort of stuff. Um, but they're encouraged to actually take the sensibilities from their major and actually use that to guide their design process. Because I want to see what a game that's designed by a spatial designer looks like, for example. Um, so the game goes through a lot of um, iterations, and what we do is we scaffold a lot of that playtesting into existing um, events and communities. For example, Wild Streets. Um, so we work with them and say, hey, have you got a thing on? Can our students come? Can they show their work? All that sort of stuff. Also, the Auckland Game Developers Meetup, which is every month, they come along, they bring their stuff. So these, um, the second two photos um, are from two separate Auckland Game Developers Meetups, and you can see there's a development uh, in, the, in the iteration you know, uh, of, the, of the designs. Um, uh, and then we move into uh, coming into sort of like play tester in about sort of five or six on the far right when we're starting to really get down the nitty gritty of how the, um, of how the rules work. I love that photo on the top right because all this stuff is designed on the fly and that's kind of the beauty of physical games because there's no code involved. If you want to change a rule, you just say it out loud <laughs> and it's done, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then, then what happened is, um, <laughs> 
forgive the pun, um, but there was some buzz generated about the game. Um, uh, and it got picked up by the Research and Innovation Office at AUT. And what they wanted to do is show this at the AUT Open Day. And we said, sure, we'll do that, but it's all just pieces of ripped up paper with, with scribbles on it. And so they helped us print it out and put, put into proper game pieces. Now, I'm not going to go into the mechanics of the game, but I can later on. Um, but essentially, it's a street game that's played in a large room. So it's not actually done outside because it wouldn't, wouldn't be able to withstand rain and all that sort of stuff. So it would be done in a room about this size, but obviously flat. Um, and so you can see in the middle uh, one down the bottom, this was actually at the open day for AUT. Um, you can see the game pieces there, how everything kind of fits together. Um, and then what happens is Sophie's, um, Sophie's work was done for the semester. And I can go into that a little bit later. And I've got a couple of slides that we can talk about how the, how the learning journey actually works within the 12 week um, kind of format. Um, but then from there, she went and took that back to her major, which was um, graphics, uh, communication design, so graphics design. Um, and she basically treated her own project as her client for a communication design project, which I thought was a really cool thing to do. We wanted to kind of encourage that as much as possible. And so the one on the far right, I had nothing to do with. It was basically her saying, okay, imagine I, me from, a, from six months ago, I come to me with this, this game project. Now, how would I communicate the game mechanics to the player? And so the one on the far right is what she did for her, her final thing. Now, there's a lot of um, things that uh, kind of tie into the themes later on that we can go into, and some that don't, and we can unpack those later. Hmm. I think I'm up next. So the, the, the case study that I had was a game called End of Danger, at least that's what it ended up being called. And uh, the story of it was I was approached by a group called Four Paws based out of Vietnam, and they wanted to push into schools. This is typically what they do. They go and they'll push into schools for a week-long course, uh, teaching about environmental conservation and animal conservation because of a, there's gross mistreatment of animals there. Bears are fire, uh, farmed for their bile, for instance. And they wanted to be able to uh, save these bears and keep them in facilities that were a little better than cages, which is what they currently were being kept in. But they also knew that they wanted to show that cities needed to grow. And there were a lot of concerns beyond environmental conservation that the government needed to worry about. So they said, well, in this week-long curriculum, we want to be able to assess all of our learning outcomes, basically. And very big teacher speak is what they came at me with. We want to assess all of these learning outcomes. And here's all of the data that we want the content delivered in this game that they wanted to play at the end. And so we, we looked at it and we said, well, whew, first of all, yeah, no. Uh, you know, the content isn't going to be the point. But they really realized that there was a lot of systems that they had in play here. There, there's concepts of environmental conservation and stress on the environment. The, the animals in particular and the ecosystems in particular weren't as important as the concept of making sure that animals are in the right ecosystems together. So we said, well, we can make a game about this. And there are a lot of um, other goals they had with this class as well, such as we want to make sure that these students are ready to go into an English speaking world. So they need to practice speaking English. And now this is coming from a student background that is not necessarily uh, used to talking in class. And that's a moment later as well. So we needed to make this game where they were comfortable, able to talk to each other and challenge each other in ideas um, and still know what they were talking about. Right, so that was one of our, our primary goals of this game. So what we ended up doing was making a mega game. And again, I won't go into the mechanics of the game, but it took place <clears throat> with up to 50 people in a single classroom over about three hours. And it was in a mega game, uh, generally they're quite timed and you have these phases and everybody's got a role to play. And in this case, they were all members of a, of a city. Uh, they were managing a city, some is the government, some of the newspaper reporters, another is um, a conservationist, another is an industrialist, and the other is the public. And they all have a single task that they manage. And then when they're managing this task, they can come back together to kind of communicate what they did. And all of these tasks they did impact each other and the singular city that they're growing at the same time as the environment around them. So that was the, that was the gameplay in a nutshell. Right? So what we ended up uh, in the end of this cre creating is this game that um, they could roll out uh, in in Vietnam with their materials that they could get it printed there. And that was one of their goals that we wanted as well, was them be able to manufacture it uh, right in Vietnam. So they, they got these big canvas maps printed out, and they sourced everything locally, which was great. Um, but it was, it was supposed to be always this very lo-fi approach that they wanted so that it could be transported, and you didn't have to worry about uh, students not having tech access, for instance, because this is something they needed to be able to take to rural schools as well as the English-speaking school that they, they had in Vietnam. 
Right. So those are the, there's a lot of these challenges. Again, these themes that we'll come up with later about how do you work with these different types of uh, populations? Um, how do you work in a complex space that's a real world when you're managing a game and designing a game for education? As well as how do you look at the assessment? Like how do you get something out of it and validate it when you have an organization that's saying, we want the X, Y, Z you know, out of this game? Right. That's it. You ready? Yeah, totally. OK, and I'm here around why, you know, why game design in the classroom? And the, we've got a series of photographs there that actually kind of link into different stories about it. The key thing for me around why game design in the classroom is asking ourselves for what purpose and how does that purpose actually connect with what we value and believe? And I think that is, again, where our themes come in together. And how I originally got into game design was I Two, kind of two things happened simultaneously. I had a classroom where the students were like, there were a handful of students that were just like needing a lot of support, so it was really socially quite explosive at times. And I also went to Rachel Bolstead's, um, um, one of those core education breakfasts around game design, and that was when I was introduced to Never Alone. And I thought, oh, there's something in these games. At the same time as my class was quite, um, you know, quite colourful, um, we had an RTLB come in and we started working with traditional card, traditional games, just the normal old games, and we did that for a whole term. And I watched the social makeup of my class change, and I thought, how do I kind of, so now I know this word, scale it up, amplify it, and so we started working with digital games, and we only played multiplayer games. It went so well, because I started seeing different things happening in my class, that we started to enter into, we do the game mechanics, um, about how do we go about designing a game? And so we got involved with NZTA, or the NZTA Game Design Competition. So there's top, um, that top photograph at the minute there is um, one of the games that's been played. Um, series of things have gone on at the very bottom there. One of the things that I see in game design um, is that students are often on the periphery of the classroom, bang, come straight into the middle. And honestly, I've never seen that happen before. You know, so the children who are not usually part of teaching learning conversations. So some examples there about, um, is it Tom writing there? Um, there was a list there of 101 things that can go wrong in the game design, there are more. Um, and then what I've actually done since going into um, AUT is to take the game design process, and what we've actually got there is that, that top corner there is that there's a whole lot of teachers, they are currently thinking about coming into university to train as teachers, and the staff were saying, oh, should we do an art activity? Should we do a science activity? And I said, well, we could do a game design process with them. And they said, mm, what is that? Let's give it a go. We gave it a go, and all 30 of those young people and older people who turned up in an hour and a half started talking to each other, started having the kinds of interactions that they've never had um, in, in a, their social situation like that. They'd normally do an art activity, so it's quite singular. Um, and in this, the last one there, um, the green one, another class where I've been doing game design was in a cultural responsive pedagogies class where a group of students were actually um, using um, knowledge um, from the Pacific to actually guide them through the game that they were designing. So just, um, it's more just to say, using that mechanic in a variety of spaces. Yeah. All right, so that's our yeah. projects in a nutshell. And obviously there's a lot of stuff in there that we can unpack. Um, and we, what we, I guess we want to do is we want to get a sense of where you guys want us to take the, yeah. take the talk. Maybe this would be a good time for you guys to chat for a minute amongst yourselves and see if there's anything in there that you want to explore more. Yeah. So if, 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 if I could give an example, I, there's a lot mm. about Diana's, like the actual, like what happens inside <laughs> a lot of the activities that you do that I would like to know. Um, and as far as kind of getting that scaffolding and kind of pushing it out to, to lower than university level teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be something that hopefully you're kind of clustered around people who you, you're kind of at the same level. That might be, mm. a, good, that might be a good thing, I think. The chances um, are you're sitting next to somebody at the primary intermediate level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, now would be a good time to um, have a chat with the people next to you and just think about what are the kind of things that you want to talk about, what's the mm. kind of questions that you want to ask. And if we do that for like... Mm. Two minutes? Two minutes, Two yeah. Minutes. So this next person next to you, just yeah. what, what was, is, was there anything they said, oh, I want to know more about that, or I did something similar, or, I've heard about something like that, or I have no idea what that was about. Uh, yeah. mm. And you'd like us to talk more about it.
I notice how Yarek, some people, they're, they're filtering and then they don't know the rule. So they'll be. ready. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, well we've, we've heard some ideas come out um, and we're happy to field, field questions and kind of direct. So maybe, maybe we get a couple of questions, like a few questions, and then we start to kind of direct um, the talk in that direction. So we've, have we got any questions? Or anything you'd like to know? Yes. yes. How did the B game actually play out in the streets? Sure, yeah. So how did the B game play out in the streets is the question over here from Jerome from Artrix. Yes. Great, okay. I think this is, because, yeah, this is, okay, this is another question, and I guess you were just wanted to know how you could get an entire community involved in a game. And I think we can kind of field this together, because that's, yeah. a lot of that's where these, these things came from, and you, he's done a lot of stuff in that area. Um, so, Right. The, the context has always been being a kind of car chase with someone else. Yeah. yeah. It's really one of the things that I'm really curious about. What, what are your insights about how these things could play out in a more permeable space? Yes, than right. Just something that is um, prompt. Even mm. if the teachers are involved, it's still prompt. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just so that's actually, so the, the idea is around kind of uh, what happens when you get the, stu the students and or the teachers involved in the design process and... and Okay. So, so kind of like making, making game, no, that's, oh. that's what I mean about yeah. like getting a community to play. Cool, right. all right. So that's actually my baby. This is the one that I pushed really hard to get in. Yeah. People start the conversation. People who are outside the education or the system push the community to the school or to the classroom. Mm. You know, so, so something happens. Even though we're in a really new space, these innovative people, really innovative people, yeah. you know, then go to a very traditional context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is why this, this, is a, this has to be a dialogic space. Mm -hmm. I'm coming from a completely different world to you guys, maybe not so much Diana Grace, but I, I'm coming from, and I'm making those mistakes already, and so I'm already learning, so that's great. And what you guys are talking about kind of falls under the... Uh, I think design for discovery. Yeah, the design that. for discovery, which is the one that I... It's very complex and difficult, and we've got more failures than successes, yeah. to be honest, and if there are more successes out there, please let us know. Um, so which direction should we go first? <laughs> yes. Uh, this game is supposed to be educational. How is it um, entertaining so we can learn about the bees? Okay, all right. So, Back to the bees. Can I get, oh, should I just hit, hit that one and we'll move on to one of the others? Yeah. So, so the bee game um, went through a lot of iterations and it eventually ended up um, becoming a brief for students to pick up at the university level. This semester, no one picked it up, so it's technically on hold. Um, the measure, how we measure the outcomes of the learning hasn't actually been done in a formal way yet. So one of, but one of the interesting things is, is, which touches on what you guys were just talking about, is when we did some of the play test sessions with some of the other students who weren't involved in the design of the game, they were needing to learn about bees in order to critique the game. And so the design of the artifact itself became the way to learn the content. So the design, sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, the design of the game itself became a way to get a deeper understanding of what the game was about. So it's almost like game design in itself was the tool. And that was actually the most interesting thing to me, which is why I really pushed for that design for discovery thing to be a part of this discussion. Because that's when you start to go, instead of giving games to teachers, what tools can you give them to co-design with their communities, wider communities or even internal communities, to design games themselves or to give those tools then to their communities so they can design the games and the game outcome itself is irrelevant 
It actually doesn't matter. It's more about the, the act of making the game that, that helps you learn it. And actually this idea, sorry, just one last thing. This idea came up um, in a discussion at um, the last New Zealand Game Developers Conference from a guy, Paul uh, Dunn, who worked on uh, e Etherlight, which is a, a game about the Bible, right? And one really interesting thing about that was that they really had to dig in to what they interpreted the meaning of those stories to be in order to bring them into the new medium because they just didn't work the way that they were written. Uh, or they wouldn't have, they thought that they wouldn't have been as successful in the way that they were written. So that means that they had to kind of boil all of the stories down to kind of their core message and then rebuild out, out of that. And what happened to the team is that because they had to do that, and they'd never had to really do that in their lives, they themselves became much more in tune with what at least they interpreted the core meaning of those stories to be. You know, whether it's the Bible or, or whatever, you know, the way bees work or whatever, the, the process is still the same. I find that really exciting and interesting to the point where I'm thinking maybe we should stop making games for people. Just give them tools. To make give them them tools, yeah, yeah. Like Game Fruit, a sponsor of this mm. conference. <laughs> I was say, um, last year with my um, seven eights, we'd done the NZTA game competition. We then put that in and made um, games around PB4L, positive behaviour for learning. Incredible process, game design process they went through, not one single finished game. But actually the effect that that process had and the level of engagement and the capabilities was totally anchored in one of our favourite books, which is Key Competencies for the Future. Yeah, it, it was just alive. I was so excited. Yeah. It does, it does get really exciting when they do actually get a playable game, though. Oh, <laughs> That's really important. Obviously, it segues into hey. the question about designing for things outside of the formal classroom setting, right? Because we're talking about giving creative people, young people especially, who are creative naturally, a tool, like a Minecraft, for instance, right? Giving them a tool and then saying, go, go do things you want with it. And oftentimes that's just, well, okay, we're gonna make a game. And the process of doing so is where they're doing a lot of learning. As Ben's talking about with the bees or with Aetherlite, they, in order to make the game right, there's a lot of dialogue that they had about bees, a lot of dialogue they had about the Bible passages to make Aetherlite. And so they're learning about it as they're doing it because they've got this goal to create a thing using the tool that they've got. So what we're looking at is saying, well, how do we do it? Well, we don't give them games necessarily. We give them playful tools and they will use the playful tools in creative ways. And then if we, you know, you can repurpose those for whatever per, you know, thing you want to make. Yeah. I can give you a couple, but you probably have heaps more tools than I do in my head. I mean, um, Minecraft, of course, Game Fruit is another one, but we're talking digital tools in this case, right? Um, there's a lot of games that are uh, like physical games about words that you can make things up with. Um, there's the game of Awesome right here in New Zealand, which was made for students in schools but is a tool, it's just about uh, generating stories. And you can use it however you want. There's no real strict rule structure that you must follow with this game of awesome. And, you, and so it's, it primarily uses a narration, a narrative generation tool. Uh, and kids loved it because it was, it was just freeing. It allowed them to, to go off in directions and look up all these things about dragons so they can make a game about dragons, you know, or a story about dragons. Sorry, it's something today. Yeah. So yeah, it does, and it feels like we're yeah, going right into that, but do we want to do real world first because all of this talks about real world yeah, I, I designing in the real a world. a logical thing, and also I think they want us to play the game. Right, right. <laughs> I'm also trying, I'm helping you out here. I'm just giving, keeping all your right. mind. So let's go with so, that then. Yes, there is process, and design thinking uh, recognizes one thing above all else, and that is <laughs> that, right? So the first step is to recognize your space, recognize the people that you're making games for, and that's, uh, the people relationships, the climate being, what's the attitudes as well as, as the physical environment. Um, so in order to really understand how a real world complex space works when we've got a game, uh, we need to give ourselves an experience that we can then talk about. So we're going to play a game called Cat on Your Head. Has anybody played this game before? Yes, okay. yes, yes, you have played this game. Good, good, right. So, um, Cat in Your Head is a fun game, but I'm going to need a couple of volunteers uh, to come down to help demonstrate how to play. Come on down. One other person just to help show yeah. Yeah. how to play this game. All right, so the basic idea of this game is that all of you are the game board, 
and we're going to be playing this game where you have a cat on your head. Right? That's the whole point of the game. All right, so hi, Rich. Donald. Hi, Donald. Nice to meet you. Donald, you have a cat on your head. Yes. Can you all see the cat on his head? Imagine the cat on his head. Now, we're going to help out your imagination because, Donald, you have one thing to indicate that you have a cat on your head, and that is you're just going to say cat, 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 over and over again. So how would you go in the head? Cat, cat. Cat, 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 Keep saying cat, 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 cat. Now, cats, of course, like to chase mice. So there is an invisible mouse over your head. I'm Rich. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Can you see the mouse? Right. We, of course, know there's a mouse because he's saying. Mouse, 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 mouse. Now, they're both saying it nice and loudly so that we can all hear where the cat and the mouse are. Cat, 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 cat. I'm going to move you over here. Now, the cat's single objective is to catch said mouse. Cat, 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 cat. But he's out of reach. So there's a somebody in between that he, the cat can move to. So you can stop saying mouse for a second. This is how they move. Cat, 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 cat. You just touch the person on the shoulder. Cat, 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 Dead. Is that right? The mouse can get away in the same way. So they can move amongst all of you simply by touching the person on the shoulder is near you, and then you will stop saying cat or mouse, and they will start saying cat or mouse. If the cat catches the mouse, the cat wins. If the mouse can evade the cat for 30 seconds, the mouse wins. Easy enough? Cool. All right. Thank you, Donald and Chris. All right, so what we're going to do is start the cat and the mouse in opposite corners of the room and see how long the mouse can evade the cat, if it is for all 30 seconds. Do if somebody has like a watch with a timer on it that can keep track better than me, so I'm going to be. This is a real thing, by the way, right? Yeah. So you, can, you can look this up and you can find it. This is it. a real game. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this game was created uh, on a whim by um, some people who run a company called Planiac, which were on that first slide with the name of it. Uh, brilliant people, and you can order this as a colorful little illustrated book that explains the rules from Planiac, this one? Um, and also goes into how you can add rules, which we're going to do shortly anyway. So what we're going to do is start with a cat and a mouse. <coughs> Anybody here want to be a cat? Congratulations. You're the cat. So the cat, so cat says, were you listening to me? Okay, 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 okay. And Donald, you're appropriately far away. Do you want to be our mouse? OK, so mouse, say mouse, 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 Do we have a timer person, or am I? 30 seconds. You got one? Fantastic. Ready, cat? Go. OK. Oh, I don't know. We're going to have to go to the camera for that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to call it a dead, a dead mouse. 20, yeah. 20 seconds and then dead. <laughs> so you can probably see just from the simple game, without adding any of the rules which this game can have, what some considerations there are in the, a real world space, and just, just the physical environment, that made it difficult or made it more fun. And you don't know the people you touch. That's weird, right? That is weird, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, are we, yeah. when are we getting to the point where we can't do that? Yeah. We can't play this game. Yeah. Stationary facing forward. Facing forward. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thing is about this exercise is that if it didn't, you guys did a really good job, by the way. I want to give you guys a round of yeah, applause. Yeah, thank you. Um, is that if it doesn't work, if no one engages, that's actually kind of the point of the discussion. Um, because what we're kind of highlighting is the, is the complex nature of, of human-centered design around system, like systems, experience of systems. Mm -hmm. Games are systems experienced, usually. Yeah. Well, they're, they're either a, a complex system or a very, very uh, simple system. Um, and you know, I don't want to talk about it too much, but the thing that's mm -hmm. interesting to me is um, the power of experiencing a system compared to the power, power of you know, either seeing a video or reading a book to get you to understand how that, you know, the complexities of either the system itself or the system or the thing that it's simulating, the thing that it's a, a model of. It's important to interject that every game is an abstraction of the real world systems and it will not be 100% accurate. So there will be problems with that. And that's actually its strength. Because when you have the difference between the system and reality, it creates good conversations about that. And that's where a lot of learning can come in. 
about why didn't this thing which actually happens happen in the game? Or why did this happen? That's weird. That doesn't happen in reality. Those kind of conversations are where we get it. Some good growth. And how yeah. that looks when you seven and eights were actually getting ready to make a game, as Ida said, yeah, yeah, choose your own groups. And because I knew what we know about groups and in the real world is that we all want to do a group together because we, all, um, we know each other, we like each other, we all like the same kind of stuff, but you get too many of the same people together and what's going to happen? Arguments, conflict. And so after three weeks, the actual students themselves knew that they needed to change those groups because you know a group of five boys, they were all scratches, they all wanted their hands on the um, keypad. Um, and so they said, oh, actually, and they were starting to invite some of the other students around the classroom who they would never usually interact with because they wanted to get the best game and they knew someone who was really good on narrative and someone who was, you know, they wanted diversity in their group. They were seeking it. That's crazy. I don't know any other curriculum area that seeks difference. You know, so, well, well. I mean, one, one thing is, in that, in that game, and in a lot of games, especially multiplayer ones, you're creating the content of the game. So we're, it's yeah. like we're being lazy, actually. Like we didn't need to really create that much because it's, it's you guys that make it, make it interesting. And that's kind of the power of those, of those sorts of things. And, yeah, and like, uh, for instance, there is a narrative that we just had. I mean, it's a loose narrative, obviously, but we could craft something around the cat who's coming there and how the mouse got stuck, I think, somewhere around here, just kind of tried to creep around the wall like mice do, and then tried to make a dart for it when the cat was near, and the cat pounced on it, almost got away. Didn't. Well, huh? well, well, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's layers that you can add to this too, being that it's a system, right? We can say things, and this is where a lot of the rules come in for that game, such as, well, what are mice like? Well, cheese, right? So you can add in cheese where people have their hand up and there's like four pieces of cheese and there's no timer anymore because why does a cat only have 30 seconds to catch a mouse? That makes no sense. So instead, the mouse has to get the cheese before the cat gets the mouse. And that's it, and those are four pieces of cheese. And that's it. Now, we can play the game again. I don't want to put us on the spot, but it only took a few minutes if you want to try it again. Do you guys want to play it again? Noting some of the difficulties, such as people are sitting far apart. Can we rectify this? I'm just, con <laughs> I'm just conscious of time. Yeah. I think we've got a lot what of content. Time is it? What time is it? It is uh, 1.40. Yeah, we're, we're going to move even... on. I'm sorry. We're going to play yeah, that game Yeah, we're going, we're going to move on a little bit. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, there was something about that that I wanted to talk about, and it's a good segue into... Um, the other topic that seems to be on everyone's mind. Um, mm -hmm. What is a model? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you, you often get people talking about kind of photorealism and stuff like that in, in the kind of games industry and this kind of this yearning to make things feel more real and all that sort of stuff. But actually, um, the power of games and experience systems is often that they don't have all the faff. They don't have the stuff that you don't need. And a model is something, like if you think of a, a model of a tank, and it, it is still the, the, the word still applies the same way. If you think of like a model of a tank or a model of like a little, uh, like a house or something like that, the tank doesn't have, usually, doesn't have removable screws because that's not why that model was made. And so a model becomes useful by omitting the information that you don't need to, to scrutinize. Um, which I, think, which I think is really important because that's when, you, as, as Richard says, you start to uh, be really hypothetical about, about, what your, what you, about your observations. Because if you look at a model that has an omission of certain types of like, mechanics or information, then you can start to think about, well, what if those things didn't actually exist and you can actually, actually be playful with, uh, with the world that you live in, of, live in in a very speculative way. Um, oh, we actually kind of gone over some of this. Some of the stuff. So I've got a story. Um, so des design for discovery. So I've got. There's kind of two things that we were talking about with this, and one is um, one is a little bit easier to explain than the other. So the first one is um, we've kind of already covered it. If you've got like a topic like bees, for example, or the Bible, um, you can use the construction of a game or the, the making of a game as, to understand that thing, whatever it is. And the problem that I think we'll have, or like I'll have, but perhaps not so much you, Diana Grace, but that I'll have with you guys is that you guys have a curriculum. There's boxes that need to be ticked. And I'm at the other end of the scale where I'm like, well, let's just play and see what happens. And what happens might be fantastic, but it might not be what you were looking for. And I'm not saying that one way is better than the other. It's just a different way of playing. And it's a very hard thing to, to, uh, to understand and describe. Um, so I'm going to... Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story about the, the photo on the right-hand side down the bottom there about a game that was made at the last Kiwi Jam. It's a physical game, not a digital game. Uh, well, sort of, sort of digital. Um, and it's going to sound dumb. Okay? It's going to sound really dumb. In fact, it sounded dumb when they pitched it because we start the weekend with everyone standing up and saying, oh, I think we're going to make a game about X. And this was their pitch. 
We're going to call this game Cram, and we're going to make up a fake, uh, basically land or a fake society of people, and you're going to, we're going to make up all of this information about them, and you're going to have five minutes to cram, and then it's a competition, it's a quiz to see who knows more, most about this imaginary uh, land and these imaginary people. Everyone in the room was like, that's such a dumb idea. <laughs> Even, including me, I was like, this is a terrible idea. Cut to the chase, it was fantastic. And it, it's the one game out of the last game jam that I've just talked nonstop about. So basically, the way it works, and I, I'm not kidding, these guys just spent, so there was, um, uh, so most of those are players, but there must have been about sort of seven people on this team. And two of them were kind of working around with mechanics and kind of the packaging up of the rules and all that sort of stuff. And the rest were just churning out facts about this, this um, they're called the Bumblestock. That was the name of the, of the people. Uh, and they did you know, history, they had like an entire tome of history, they had an entire tome of science and an entire tome of language, and they had to be very collaborative about it. Um, and the way that actually, one thing that they did really nice with the mechanics is they said, we're going to give you a quiz, and so you have like a team, uh, so like five people on one team, five on the other, and we're gonna give you a quiz and we're gonna ask you questions, but the questions aren't cherry picked out of the, um, uh, the tomes. There's something that aren't in the tomes that you need to kind of infer based on the information that you know of all the other stuff. And keep in mind, keep in mind, there is no way you can read all of this stuff. You have to skim, you have to dart, you have to try and go, I think this is useful, so I'm going to commit it to memory. This is not so useful, so I'm going to skip it. I was on language in my team, and because there was one person on language on both teams, and we started on nouns, and I said to my opponent, how far are you through? And it was like four minutes through the five-minute cram mark, and he was like, I'm halfway through nouns. And it was like, okay, we've got to just try and figure out strategies in order to understand this culture through the language. So what, what ends up happening is you end up collaborating with each other in order to, um, to find kind of like knowledge that wasn't in any of the tomes. And what they did with the mechanics, which was quite nice, is they went, we're going to give it to the people who are kind of closest to the, to the, um, to the actual kind of fact, because there is no fact. But here's the reason why I'm bringing this up. That was a dumb idea. And by the end of it, it was just people nonstop. Like people just couldn't stop talking about it. You can only play it once, because once you've played it, you've kind of ruined it, because you've, you've read enough that playing it again would kind of be cheating. But there was a point where I was playing with four people on my team, five on the others, where everyone just started giggling. Right? And that's, that, that's, the, that's delight, right? That's the sign of delight. And the only reason, like, because, you know, one by one, everyone starts just going, what the f are we doing? Like, what is the point of this? If someone said, okay, does anyone here know anything about Germany? And everyone said, no, it's like, okay, we're going to learn about Germany. I don't think it would have been the same. I think the ridiculous nature of the, of the, of the act mm -hmm. was what made it fun, the fact that it was arbitrary and useless. That was not their intention. And yet that was a really interesting design uh, kind of uh, schema that emerged out of the construction of something that they just kind of through together in 48 hours. And so to me, that kind of stuff is really interesting, is what happens when you just let the chips fall and, and see what emerges out of it. Now, of course, there are plenty of stories about um, games such as, if anyone's heard of a game, um, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, uh, where you're trying to def defuse a bomb and no one else can see the bomb, you've got VR on and everyone's trying to help you, and they literally just have printouts of just like dozens of pieces of paper with the instructions, and they have to keep like kind of looking through them. Games like that coming out of game jams, I wonder how true those stories are and how much those things were already baked beforehand, but there's certainly a lot of stories about accidental kind of beauty coming out of these kinds of um, scaffolded kind of design things. I want to dig into that story for a second. So uh, the thing that was really interesting to me about that story is the f you're not actually looking up the information when you're asked the question, you've got to infer it. So Ben, what was the result of that mechanic, I guess you'd say, in the game of, of the People being asked the question, they had to infer the knowledge. Top of the list is collaboration. Yeah. So that was the thing, because you got five people on your team, right? So you're like, did you read this? Did you read this? And everyone says no. So you go, okay, but I read something similar about this other, because there's the dough leg and the cut gun and all this sort of stuff. You know, something similar. So I don't think it's that, because I don't think both, they would write, you know, like both um, creatures to be the same. And I think this one breeds like that, because that one kills like this and all that sort of stuff. And so you get this kind of cross, you know, uh, collaboration where it's like, I know the word for this. And actually, the thing that made it hard is that every word also had a symbol as well, so it was very difficult. Um, and so you have to kind of like get those two pieces of information, or three or even four, and kind of piece them together to try and come up with an answer. But there is no right answer. There is a right answer, but that's not how you get the, that's not, but that's not how you get the point. Yeah. No. So that's not how you get the point. So okay. in a way, there is no right answer. Right. There's just a better answer based on how close you are to, okay. to, the, to the thing. And it's usually obvious. 
Like, mm. it's not like there's a judge. Like, they say the answer, and one team will go, ah, and the other team will go, yeah. OK. Um, really? I feel like I kind I of railroaded like, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, a little bit, bit, but it was a good story. Right, so um, other things for designing for discovery. That we're, we're, we're gonna go off. Do you guys have any questions on that story? Um, well, are we talking about specifically in kind of playful design spaces where there, aren't, there is yeah. not necessarily a, an outcome in mind, or are you talking about just in general? I think in general, because it seems to be like, to me, I was recently got into the whole game of like, yeah. learning things. It was good, it was another trick to do because you learn science. Right. I've, I've, got a, I've got a story. You know, but as it turned out, it was so much richer. It developed. Yeah. Well, it is one of our key themes, actually, mm. that we can, we can go into. Do you want to continue on? Or I've got a story. 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 We'll story. We will story. definitely cover that, and Slide. we'll definitely talk about mechanics <laughs> as well. OK, the story I've got is around collaboration, what, because this whole thing in primary schools around collaboration is really dear to my heart, because we are so good at sharing. And that when we talk about groups getting together, they're sharing stuff. And they're sharing stuff really, really well. And so I'm going, so where are the opportunities for what is collaboration? It is about doing something different that you could not have done on your own. Um, and so they've, they've got some fantastic ideas. But I was like, well, how can I do this in the classroom? So the slide I'm looking for, no, 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 um, is um, when we were doing the, oh, sorry, number 23. Thank you, yay. We decided we weren't gonna do these slides, Linley, so it's causing a... Um, so what happened was that these um, young men up here, they were doing the New Zealand um, game competition. They had um, they put their um, board all sorted, and they said, we just need taxis, we really need taxis. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, we really need a 3D printer. It was back in the day when it was really, 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 really cool to have one. And I said, well, um, Oh, well, what are we going to do? And they said, well, we can't do it. And I said, well, let's go on Twitter. Why don't we just put a question out on Twitter? And so we used the um, Welly Ed hashtag. Um, and we just said, we're doing the New Zealand, I mean, we're doing the NZTA game sign competition. We need to make taxis. Can someone help us know how to, you know, do 3D printing? And from that tweet, two educators contacted us <laughs> through our class Twitter account. One of them ended up... Um, Oh, and also the well ed people sort of popped it around through um, Twitter, thank you. And then we actually had a teacher out in Whitby, um, he came at, he, through Twitter, he actually taught them, um, he sent them a, see I, I don't even know what I'm talking about because I wasn't involved in it. They sent them like a template, they worked out how to make these um, taxis. Um, he, they then sent them and they kind of did prototypes of, it, of them. He then printed them out at his school. Our teacher had a principal's meeting out in Whitby somewhere. He left them by the school letterbox. They picked up their taxis and brought them back to the game. Now, that is a complex space. I had nothing to do with it. And the boys, they were so excited to, you know, to get this stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to scaffold that collaborative environment. Oh. Um, I don't know, I, you know, this is going to take us a while. Yeah. 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 Right, so, a tool. So you're under the normal symptom. Rory's Story Cubes. You guys familiar with the Rory's Story Cubes? Great little thing, right? Pictures on dice roll and boom, got things. Um, so in terms of fostering collaboration amongst people, is that kind of something you're interested in? Is that what is it? Yeah. Right, the scaffolding, right? So let me, let me put all this thoughts, picture. All thoughts around. All thoughts the around significance. Around. One thing I would just say before he starts, you're going to get a lot of, it's, it's hard, you're going to get a lot of resistance if you're trying to create things that don't have an outcome, if you're looking at those kind of playful design spaces. 
every person that you try to work with is going to ask you to produce something specific and it's going to be very difficult. But that's if only if you're working in that kind of playful space. But again, if the point is collaboration and teaching them how to collaborate, then that's really, that's the focus anyway. So it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter what they're getting out of it at the end as much as they can show the process they went through. But if the teaching and learning is so delicious, you don't have to teach it, they just desperately want it and they are working really hard until they're actually doing it. Do you know, like, there, there is a sl yeah. slight difference. This is a fun, hey. so you talk about, this is a fun exercise actually, yeah. and it's a great way to collaborate. Uh, at Kiwi Gym before, so for those who aren't from Auckland, so this is at MOTET, Museum of Transportation Technology up in Auckland, they got a cool space called the Idea Collective. And um, that's just explaining what it is and why there's a cool geodesic dome behind us. So the idea uh, behind this ideation and playtesting um, is we'll, t we'll take Rory's story cubes, for instance, and we'll just have them in, in individuals uh, with a bunch of dice, and you roll them all on a table. And then you get these sticky notes, and you, uh, you look at the dice, you look at the dice, and then you just kind of writing things down for each sticky note you have that apply to each Sorry. Dice. Should we just describe the cubes a little bit? <laughs> Like so, so, so they're just they're, they're yeah. essentially dice. Yes. Uh, but dice. they just have images on them, so they're very abstract, right? Yeah. And it might be like an image of a house or a tree or, or a, a demon. A lot of figures. A, There's yeah, the whole yeah. set around actions. Yeah, yeah. So there's people running or a. A, yeah. a die with somebody holding an umbrella up and things so like that. So yeah. there's a level of uncertainty in the interpretation of what that means, which yeah. is which is vital to right. the. You can you can you can buy them at most bookstores, like Whitcools and things. They're really around. cool. Really Roy Storkips. Yeah, there's an app. There's an app for Roy Storkips. Oh, sweet. So they are fantastic just for generating uh, random pictures. And part of this design process is ideation. And of ideation is the marriage of two disparate ideas and and getting people to think like that. So using these cubes and first getting them to look at the pictures and then. As a group, they are just labeling these pictures with a, a word, you know, describing that. Or if it's a picture of a volcano, it might just be magma that they write, or it might be violence, or it might be eruption, you know, it could be anything like that. And after they've done this, then they rotate around to other groups, of course, and they've got now words that they didn't generate, but other people did. And they're selecting a few of these that they need to then incorporate into a single idea that they are then going to say, well, I need to make a game out of this, for instance, because again, going through the design process is the game design process was the point and not the actual game, because they wouldn't, in the end, they weren't making a game. They were just talking about the game. And so what we would have them do is, is they're gonna sit and they think individually for a minute um, about this game. They're just thinking, what's a story that I can make with this, a person <laughs> holding an umbrella, a, an erupting volcano, and a rose? You know? Can I just interject, because I think there's one really important thing that you taught me that I think you might, might be missing, which is really important, that, that the, the exercise forces you to let go of the ones you wrote. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you can't become attached to your idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and that's hence the idea of cycling around in somebody yeah. else's group through the words. Yeah. Selecting these cubes, actually, that, this is another step. You select cubes into groups, and then you leave those, and you go to someone else's group of selections. And then you take those ones, and you say, well, okay, how can I make those into the little story? Um, and so you, you say, well, okay, here's, here's who I am, here's who the player is, here's what they're trying to do, and here's why it's difficult. Uh, generally, going back to the idea of you could do a task, but if you put unnecessary complications in the way, it can often make it more fun. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. why people play Minecraft, right? Uh, digging isn't fun, but if you've got to survive the night now because creepers are coming, now it's a little more fun. Sort of. So you get these story that you make, and you've generated this by yourself, and now the idea is again to share it. So uh, we do, you know, whatever setup you want, but a couple rings, inside ring, outside ring, and you're just talking with somebody. And so you and I would share our story in a couple of minutes. Very strict on the time for that because one of the goals of this activity is to get you to refine the idea to fit within those two minutes so you can clearly express the essence of it within a very short period of time. Because once you've been able to do that, you've got a design, really. Um, so after they share it, then they critique. They kind of ask questions about it because obviously in those two minutes, you're not gonna understand the game very much. So it's like, so what's going on with the volcano? Why? So the rose, they're growing on the volcanoes? Is that? And they see that they're missing the point when they describe these things. They're really, it's all about yeah. screwing up, right? Because you, you're saying, well, obviously, no, the game, just because the roses are growing in the volcano is not important. Instead, the roses are what you're collecting. So they realize, oh, I should be talking about how there's a goal to collect these roses that are growing mm -hmm. in the volcano. So they refine then their description. And so, of course, then they're gonna rotate around so that they're talking with different people and then they just describe the idea again and again. Can I interject again? Please. So, it's, But it's also not just about refining the way you communicate it or even your own understanding of the project. The project, what I notice when you have these exercises is they morph. 
Mm. They mutate. They mutate based on the reactions from other people, but they also mutate on the ideas of other people. In fact, I've seen yeah. a lot of situations where some of the best designers I know in Auckland, the ones that are doing lots of stuff like Richard, by the end of it, you can see that they've kind of borrowed from other people and they've oh, kind yeah. of put stuff together. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, but so it's a collaborative um, yeah. experience. And there. refine. We could do, refine doesn't necessarily mean I had an idea and I'm going towards it still. It does mean I'm just making it better mm. by including things that other people have said. Yeah. Mm. So if they don't do things like this and put them through a kind of process, they're reluctant to iterate, they're reluctant to change mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But the other really nice thing about this is that you're building a sense of shared ownership. If I start mm -hmm. by rolling on those dice and then someone else is making the story with it, I can say, well, that's the part I have to do now. So suddenly the final product's all of them and a piece of you in that as well. Mm. Absolutely, I believe so. So yeah. what level do you teach? Intermediate. Intermediate, yeah. okay. And you're saying that that's potentially a positive thing. Or do you do it yourself? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And, and great. It, but it's something that they don't naturally have. Yes. And it's something that the kids who pick up ideas very quickly or do higher end learners are even more reluctant to let go of control. Mm. So they're like, no, I can do this. Mm. I'm like, actually, think of what you could do with other people. Mm. I like that definition you gave before of doing something different that I couldn't have done on my own. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was really all that story there. <laughs> That's the end of it. Um, in the end, though, again, yeah, they're creating, a, they're co-creating a story, but they're not. The the point being, abdicate your idea, right, for the, this collaboration. You don't, you don't, you don't get the chance to fight for it. It's just going to be included or not going to be included on the strength of its merit. Mm -hmm. Is, are there a primary, who, who in here actually already uses that in the classroom? Yeah, quite a few. It's really powerful. It's incredibly powerful, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, pretty much every single one of my game students in any, in any form, in any school, they do a lot of assumption mapping straight off because it actually is very helpful because you, you, you want to teach them that your assumptions are going to be wildly incorrect, but it's better to have them because it points you in the right direction or it puts you in our direction. And actually, that's, that's one thing that I, I don't know exactly where this comes up, but um, when, actually, no, it's in the, can we go to the slide yeah, yeah. just before? Uh, sorry, guys. Um, there's oh, <laughs> collaboration, yeah. Um, so, uh, what I did with some of my students is, um, you know the, the thing that Richard was just describing, I did this other thing on the top of it where every time they rotated, I was getting them to kind of um, classify themselves under various uh, metrics uh, and having these kind of things all over them. So for example, there was Myers-Briggs, there was um, Bartles, uh, so Myers-Briggs, yep, yeah, yeah cool, um, it's just uh, personality types. Um, uh, for, uh, what kind of play aesthetics you gravitate towards. And by the way, if you're trying to get into getting uh, anyone, but children uh, involved or any, any person who's trying to learn involved in a, um, in a game of any sort, you need to get your head around play aesthetics because every everybody is different. Everyone is going to gravitate towards a different type of play aesthetic. I, I can maybe talk about that a little um, bit. Well, later. I think it's enough to say start with Bartles for player types. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a model. Um, and so then, Bartle's uh, one is actually out there. I don't think, do we, maybe, it's that little picture of the I'll the describe axes, it, why not? Yeah, so, it. so it's basically, there's two, there's two axes. It's um, do you, so this, this guy, Richard, right? Was it Richard Bartle? Richard Bartle. Richard Bartle. Yeah. Um, he was around in the time of the MUD, which was a multi-user dungeon game, um, which was all text-based. And he kind of tried to classify um, the, all the types of players there were and kind of classified four personality types that you kind of, gravitate towards one more often than the others. And so, for example, there are basically two um, axes, and one is um, uh, subscribing to or kind of working in harmony with, and the other one is, at the other end is dominating. Uh, and then the other axis, you've got um, um, uh, people, so social sociability, mm -hmm. and at the other end, you've got uh, kind of dom... dom uh, uh, Antisocial. Yeah, and, yeah. So, the, so the world, so the world, no, it's the world. Oh. Yeah, the world. So it's like the, the environment, the kind of the uncovering of the... of what is inside the content of the game or whatever. And so what you get is, for example, people who um, like to work with people are the socializers, right? People who like to dominate people are the competitors, right? They're the, they're, he called them 
killers, killers. I think, yeah. because and that's been changed. A lot of people have, re re -changed, have changed this later on, because back in the day, those people would quite often log on to a mood when, no one, when someone was asleep in an inn, and they'd bribe the innkeeper and kill them. Um, so that's why they kept, got called killers. There's also um, <laughs> there's a couple of other things up there. One of them is the, the uh, chart around uh, uh, alignment. This was a total fun thing. I just want to point that out. I, I think it's completely broken. So the way alignment works is you've got good and evil, ordered and, yeah. and uh, chaotic. It was just a fun thing. So don't copy that. Um, but what we did um, is we had, uh, we basically have a 12, a 12 week cycle. And what we do is, has anybody here seen the lecture by John Cleese where he talks about uh, creativity and open and closed minded thinking? Okay, I'm seeing a few nods. Look it up. Definitely okay, look look it, it up. It's it really down. good. And what I found is that um, there's a lot of stuff, again, around uh, Lego Serious Play, look that up as well. Um, there's a lot of things around how we think. Like, you know, at least I did when I was young. I got told that we think with our brain. Yeah. But actually, it's not as simple as that. There's a kind of a hive mind and even embodied um, act of, of thinking. And making something in the real world, for example, has a specific um, uh, kind of like learning outcome, even mm -hmm. even. I'm going to give this to you for a second, Ben, before you're going to go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Here, um, one of the purposes of getting the students to identify their play aesthetic in the first place is because knowing that game design is messy and the real world is messy, it's really key that they, well, they are the first audience, right, mm -hmm. when they're making their own game. Yeah. So they need to know what's fun. What, how do you define fun? How do I define fun, what's fun mm. for me, so that they can then reflect on that when they're making games and compare with other people. Thank you, because that's super important. When I finally got my head around play aesthetics, it just blew everything wide open. It's like, you know, people can disagree about something, and that's fine, because people gravitate towards different aesthetics. And then you start to think about, well, if I gravitate towards an aesthetic, but it's already satiated in another part of my life, do I then need it in the game I'm about to play? So there's all those kinds of things. It's actually much simpler than it sounds, but have a look at it. Play Aesthetics, Robin Hinnick et al. I don't know who else was, was on that. Um, and so, so what we did is um, there's a 12-week cycle, and I, this, uh, this might not be applicable. In fact, I'm interested to hear what you guys say about it. But with university students, you don't get much more out of them if you ask them to work for four weeks than two. There's, this, 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 there's like this, a certain amount of time that you can spend. And so what I do is we have um, uh, critical reflection points every three weeks, but where they're specifically asked not to be too critical in those other two weeks. So there's very much like a let go, discuss what you produce. Like let go of your idea, collaborate, and then discuss what you produce critically. And that's the point to reflect. Um, so that was the thing I kind of, uh, I guess I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Um, more on collaboration and how to scaffold it a little bit. And particularly with uh, this, this, this goes back to the idea of diverse learners in groups, right? And people, um, needing to work together who don't normally work together like they do in intermediate school. They're not necessarily used to letting go of their ideas, not used to playing well with others, maybe. Um, and that is uh, an example from the End Danger game, which was uh, how do we get these students to work with each other on a team when they don't, when there's usually a very dominant structure, or there's a hierarchy there of saying, well, this person's the older one, we're all going to listen to him. That's it. There's no question. I do not raise my voice in this. I don't, I don't bring up any idea of, of collaboration. I don't, my, my ideas are worthless. So um, <clears throat> the idea was in this give every player, uh, as you do in a classroom setting, a different role to play in a group, mm -hmm. particularly in a science classroom. This happens all the time in a lab group. You give a very specific role. And not only do they have the expertise, but they've got to be the only one with the knowledge in that mm -hmm. area because then they have to participate. They're the, like, in order for the group's survival, mm -hmm. their contribution is necessary, and they're the only ones who can contribute it. Can I put an exclamation point in there, or, or a red flag? This works really, really well, but sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, it, it, it usually works really, really well, because <laughs> yep. what, you're, what you're saying is the onus is on you not only to yeah. do that work, but to defend it. To go, you have the, you have the uh, appreciation of the particular aspect of the project, but every now and again, mm someone that drops the ball. It, depend, yeah, it depends yeah. on, on the structure around it. Like if there's, if it's, a, it's simply an input that the different students or the players are, are contributing to it. Like in the End Danger game, they went away. They were separate from their group. They did a task. They brought the results back of their task to the group. They made a decision while they were over there. They, they can defend it, but they're basically they're done, right? They, they, here's the thing that we contributed. And so there isn't a lot of argument about it because there was very limited input in that regard. This is a thing that I did, right? Uh, but yes, especially at the higher levels, you've got to worry about <laughs> group project work. It's basically is what it is. You're going to have people who are 
yeah. not working. Well, as we said, yeah. we don't have the silver bullets. No. Yeah. Let me do the story. Yes. Story time. Story. Please share. Okay, yeah. Um, slide something. Slide uh, 26. Um, this story is, um, is um, linking to what they're, um, what they're talking about, and that game design in the classroom has set the conditions for students to say, no, no, I don't agree. Like, we always want our students to do this, but it's actually really hard and to do it authentically. And so this particular um, example here is that this young man, Tom, I said, okay, as part of all the game development, because I wanted to use literacy as part of the process of game design, we're going to start writing game, game reviews. And he said, no, I don't agree. We can do a much better way of doing this. And so he actually wrote that down, and he... Um, he actually wrote down the process and then he recorded the process because everybody wanted to hear from this particular student about how to write a game review. All of a sudden, all the other information in the classroom was null and void and he became the centre person for two weeks whilst they got their work done. So, and what also happened for, in that situation, being able to say no, he was actually able to improve ideas, the idea of idea improvement in the classroom. He was a really central player um, in that happening. I was so excited. I hadn't ever actually really played with that in a way that was being led by students. And so I put their dispositional because, boy, boy, I learn stuff as a teacher, um, but the students do as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, it sounds like the stories you're telling are really about, um, it's lovely to hear stories of just the, uh, the dynamic the spaces that you are in are and that you're really um, giving ownership over the um, the collaboration and the kind of creative problem solving to the learners that you you have because i i feel like game design really allows for that <sighs> other disciplines um yeah you know so much yeah. like allow them to um discover the, their own problems and be their own solution yeah. finders and one of, the, one of the retreats for me, because I've been going up to AUT, is I reconnected with the book Key Competencies for the Future. So when it first came out, I know 2014, I'm pulling out a number here, um, and I kind of looked through it thought, yeah, 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 this is great, this is great, Key Competencies for the Future. But since I've got involved in game design, I'm like, we can nail this. We can actually do this. It, it, it's happening. And then when I met these two, I was like, you're really doing it in the big wide world. But actually, I could really see that there were essences of what we were doing in the classroom. That Do, uh, you guys are just I said the exact opposite. I was like, she's the real deal here. No! Like, we're, the, uh, we're the outsider, which is why I think the team was quite good. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We, when we first met each other, we just went, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah. do we, are we doing the same thing? Yes, we all are. <laughs> and yet yeah, I still yeah. get killed by a bear 95 times or whatever. And that's because I have no idea how the functionality actually works. You know, on the computer. <laughs> yeah. And this idea of, um, I really didn't know how this was going to go down today, this idea of <laughs> collegiality versus congeniality in this, yeah. in this context. Right. Uh, just coming from being in the university system, mm. trying to deprogram students from thinking that disagreeing is a, is a, is a bad thing. Uh, what was the we thing we were going to disagree on? Okay. Oh, we, we, <laughs> we, we, we were disagreeing earlier on, I remember talking about Minecraft, for instance, uh, oh, yeah. the basic task of, of digging things, but you make it difficult with unnecessary stuff in between. Yeah, when you put an arbitrary um, barrier in the way of something, for yeah. some reason, it seems to make it fun in the same way that the Bumble Stock kind of game and, uh, seemed to just magically work, even though it was essentially just studying. Um, and yeah, so yeah, we, and we, we could dive into that if we wanted. Yeah. I, uh, really interesting discussion. I want to hear a bit about how we have an established narrative already, how we can, or your experiences in trying to turn that into a game, like the, um, the thinking Home Alone. Never, yeah, never Alone? Mm -hmm. You know, they had narratives. They wanted to turn that into a game. Mm. Have you tried to turn, you know, established narratives into a board game or some other form? Interestingly, my master's was on game narratives. Uh, uh, but I was looking at very specific design schema, very, sorry, very broad design schema, and my specific narrative was my own. Uh, and what, what I was looking at is the community. So this was back in 2008 or 9 or something like that. So a lot of this stuff is actually either old hat or it's actually outdated by now. But I was looking at the idea of a community of narrative. So the community around a narrative. And that's actually what Paul Don was talking about. The the, so this is the guy who was talking about Etherlight. The title of his talk was Sacred Stories. Um, the Bible, Blade Runner, and something else. Um, 
and it's really important that you understand you know you kind of draw a theoretical line around the people that have the emotional or affective and the kind of cognitive attachment to that story before you start to design it but I mean I guess that to me it just sound, it, it sounds like duh. <laughs> um, I can't, I don't, it's funny, I should be able to offer more to you considering the, yeah, well, the title. Okay, well, I, can, I, can, I can say some <laughs> things around it. Right? So there, on the operational level of like how do you functionally do this, um, I mean, you, you've got to start looking at things, well, how can I do in a digital game or a physical game, right? If I'm doing a digital game, how can I look at things like environmental storytelling, for instance? Do I need to tell this story with words? Can I just make this, uh, this place look? A, like a post-apocalyptic wasteland, and that tells something, and oh, there's a skeleton over there with a radio next to it, and it's got a radio thing in its hand. Like, that tells me a, a story, right, that what happened there. So those are some of the questions you need to be able to ask when you're looking at the narratives that you're telling. Um, one then needs to say also, is the narrative that we're talking about a, a process, or is it actually a, a story, like a myth of some kind? Um, because if it's a process, you can model it systematically, right, in a game, because the games are systems in a lot of ways. So that's, that's another question. So a lot of the games that I make uh, have a system base to it because they're physical games and it's a little easier to do that. For example, the thing, yeah, if, if you've, just judging on your age, yeah. um, the thing, the, the, the movie with the creature that can morph into anybody. The is, thing. The thing. The have thing? you seen that film? Where it can, it's the like thing? an alien. That, oh, no, 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 it's quite no, old. That's why it's just, like, quite old. So just our, came out. our generation. <laughs> um, we'll but it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. from a movie. For instance, so, so there's a game. Yeah, so here's the, here's the story of this game. So the thing, uh, you guys familiar with the thing? The thing, right? Enough, right. all right. So basically an alien that look, can look like anybody and then it can turn other people into other th the things, right? So and it was sent in Antarctica. So we made a Wild Streets game of this. And in fact, those pictures of the, ide of the ideation, if anyone can go there, um, was us play testing this game. So the basic idea was, well, we want to tell the narrative of the movie, which was uh, these, these research scientists in Antarctica in a research station, um, and they have, they suspect that one of them is the, th uh, the, the thing, and they need to get off of the base, and they need to get back to civilization, but they don't want to bring the thing with them, right? But they also don't want to all die, so they're not necessarily trying to burn down the place. They want to, if they do, they want to make sure it's there and they're in the helicopter on the way out. Meanwhile, it's trying to kill them all because it can turn them into itself it, or escape so it's trying to blend in. So we made a big system that models this. And the key things that I wanted to get were, what are the emotive aspects of this game? There's a lot of paranoia in this game. There's a lot of uh, running around because there's a time limit. Things are getting cold. You're in Antarctica. You're running out of supplies. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make sure that uh, people had the fear, not just of like, you may be the thing, but I don't want to be alone with Ben because Ben may be the thing. I wanted the physicality of the people mm -hmm. to be involved with this. So, I made a mistake. This is a tiring game. You're tired <laughs> by the end of it. It's tiring it's, because yeah. you, are, you are literally running uh, quite a bit in this game. So uh, the, the very basics of, it, basics of it are is that you, you're gathering together in the common room and you, you plan out what you're trying to do because the base is falling apart because the thing is sabotaging things. So then you go running around this giant space, which in this case we had the Idea Collective, um, trading these, these balls out that were basically playpen balls uh, and trying to, to gather them to fix stuff. Right? And, and, or you're going out and trying to explore the wilds to find evidence that there is the other thing, and so you can make these you know, blood tests and whatever. So while you're doing this, you're going into these secluded areas where there's a wall here and now no one can see me, but what if someone else comes in here while I'm in here? I don't want to be in here very long, and, but Diana Grace doesn't want to be alone because she thinks so and so is a thing, so she's coming with me and she's not going to leave me alone. So you end up with this, this tension of people not trusting each other just as they move around the space because mm. they know the other person can turn them into a monster while they're around. So they end up creating this narrative afterwards. So the entire story of the thing, well, from beginning to end, basically comes out in the play of this because they are able to say at the end of this, oh my God, we need to be able to fix this wall because there was an explosion and we're gonna lose all of our food supplies, right? This kind of thing happens in the, in the movie, right? So they, they then respond to it inappropriately with all of the paranoia. They start saying, no, we need to make these blood tests now. We need to spend these resources to do it, blah, blah, blah because they think Ben is the thing and their time is close, they need to get to the helicopter, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so and it's, I think the interesting thing is, and this is what I was actually going to say, is that um, uh, same with my masters, it was never about his blow by blow story because narrative to me was much more of a kind of a, um, a like a meta, it was a meta narrative yeah. thing. It was about you know, what is the core kind of key 
uh, ideas and emotions of that of that narrative. And so to me, that's how I often approach things as well. It's like if you've got a narrative, let it emerge mm -hmm. out of the out of the play of the of the system. It's never kind of like a linear thing. But and, and you, you go, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's all yeah. like um, what we've been learning about um, people creating things that don't actually end up with a game and a picture table at the end. But mm. if I wanted to create a game, that's. Mm. Start with the emotions. Well, yeah. Always start with the emotions. When you change behavior, it's because you feel something about something else. Yeah. And you don't just tell someone about it in the game. <coughs> and you've you just make them feel reminded it, me that there's a, this the perfect slide game. that I should have had in there about to kind of pick your battles. So when you're looking at the. We, do you have got some oh. input for us? Input. Um, Yeah. yeah. So, the, so there's two different. We're having two different discussions here. Can I tell a quick story before yeah. we do that? Yeah. So, um, working where I do, we I work with a lot of lecturers that are trying to do just this, right? Particularly once you're doing uh, social practice. And so we had uh, the classic game, which is there's many iterations of the style of game about talking about um, social inequity, appropriate for the conference, right? And so uh, we had a we had a lecturer who wanted to make a classroom game where they very clearly let people know that not everybody starts on a level playing field and that this limits the choices that you get to make in life. And there was actually a really good choose your path kind of uh, digital game that came out recently um, about this. There's just on the web. I think you can find it on the spin-off. Right? But this game uh, was a physical classroom game, and it, was, it started off incredibly simply. Everybody just draws a card from a deck, and that tells them where they were born. And then they've got these, these choices that they're allowed to make where they're rolling dice to determine, like a single D6, and say, Here, here's your money that you income that you got, and I'll you know, feed your family. Um, well, you gotta pay for daycare, you know, these kind of things. So they, they recognize the limitations of the system there because they think that's where the game plays foul. They're like, I just drew from a deck of cards that my, where I was born. It's like, well, yeah, did you, did you get to choose where you were born, right? No, it's a deck of cards. So the, the limitation, which actually replicated the reality in this case, was something that they, they pulled out and wanted to discuss, but then realized that, well, yeah, that is actually how that part goes. And then they wanted to look at the distribution of the deck, like how do we, how do we make it more reflect uh, New Zealand's uh, distribution of, of, and then they said, what kind of factors should we take into account for this? Should it be where you're born? Should it be what much money? Is that what's important? Is that what actually determines your output? And then they started exploring all these concepts about what causes social inequity. Mm -hmm. In the first place. And, and it's, uh, what jumped in my mind is that I had a, we sort of slapped there before and it said 101 things that can go wrong with game design. And I asked the students after a full year of designing games, we kind of looked at all these different variables, what are all the things that can go wrong? Let's just like whack them all down. And honestly, within a country mile, they said it was the people in our group. It wasn't the resources, it wasn't the ideas, it, was all, it, it came down to how we actually work with others and work with people, which for me, totally, I totally knew it was back to the key competencies about managing self, relating to others, participating and contributing. What do I value? Um, how does it connect to my beliefs? How does it connect to your beliefs? We're about to do something together. You know, like, I can talk ad nauseum about that kind of thing because I just see it. I couldn't believe it. It's out of, the, out of their mouths. And it's easy enough for us to talk about establishing empathy between students, just to say, oh yeah, do it. Just establish some empathy between your students, yeah. so, because then they can work well together, really, that's the idea. If I could oh, just keep addressing this, though, um, yeah. that we, <laughs> no, the, no. The, the, the road to behavior change graduates through many stages. I forget what they're all called, and someone please chime in if you can remember them, but in my experience, you have to pick your battles, because there's all the way from the kind of, before you even know about the problem to solving it, and there's even just, like, you know, awareness is always the easy one. It's like, it's two ways, awareness, and we do that because you 
usually it means you don't have to do ethics approval for yeah, most yeah. or most yeah. cases. And the thing is, measuring it is very difficult. And if you look at the ones like Sparks, for example, you know Sparks, which is the is Maru here, um, which is um, you know around depression. They had to go through years of clinical trials to actually kind of measure the outcomes of this thing, and it's quite difficult. Had a question. question. Ah. Whew. How did I start? I, I've been having should a little. I, should I raise that? We've got six minutes. You get, you get, yeah. You got five. Okay. Okay. Are, are they going to get? Are you guys going to get these slides? Sure. We can why not? Make them. Can we, okay. Can we send them through? If you go onto Twitter, at the very top of my Twitter um, thing, 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 I pinned on it some slides that I used for game design, which is actually a accumulation of working with Dan, Rachel, and Leanne, who's also in here, so you can just see it. Come and see me. But also, one of the things, resources, Leanne, can you just, so what, you, you just put them in. And we put that resource on Twitter. Yeah, but it's also at the top of my Twitter slide. I'll make sure it's there. I know we've got six minutes. Oh, it's just Diana Grace NZ. Diana Grace NZ. And it's one. It's, it's, it's actually some slides that I think I did for some students that I've worked with recently. Um, um, can I have hands up? Who would like to just know how the hang do I roll this out um, in my classroom on Monday? How many of you are there? Because there are actually, a few, we could actually run, we could actually run something where you could actually just copy it almost just to get started. Would you be in, hands up if you'd be interested? If we, whoa, <laughs> Leanne, we need to talk. Well, <laughs> okay, do let's do it. Yeah, like, yeah, I know. You're doing awesome things. Yeah, okay. Um, we should well, do it. Just being, just being aware of time. Um, so that's probably a good slide to leave up. And obviously, there's kind of questions that only got kind of half answered and all that sort of stuff. And there's way more information than that we could ever cover. So we will send them out. Hopefully, yeah, that's fine. I don't, I don't see why it would be fine, uh, not be fine. Uh, so that you guys can all have a look at the slides and all the notes in there. Hopefully, it makes some sense. Um, for yeah. all of the people who asked to, to know how the B game worked, um, St. James tonight. I can talk about yeah. it. So <laughs> just, we'll just get yeah, get a pint, go in the corner, and I can explain how it works. Yep. If I bought it, which I couldn't because I didn't have the weight and the plane, then we could have played it. Yes. So I, I would just like to say that when I analyze my own results, and obviously this hasn't started to happen until the last couple of years, I, I think my interpretation is that I'm doing a very good job. Mm. But sometimes it's complex, right? It is complex. Mm. And you, sometimes it's, I mean, maybe it's not, but it feels like it's out of your control. Some students just are like that. Maybe environment was just. Yeah, well, the, I think letting go, that, that exercise around letting go of your idea, I think that's a really good one. It's, it's, As a teacher, it's stressful that they're not mm. doing yes. it, and they, you can't see a big shift. Mm. No. Having nudge, small amounts, go, small yeah. amounts, yeah. yeah. We yeah. should talk some more. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk if some I'm more. I'm going to tell a little Be good. No story, but um, yeah. having been a teacher, I, I, in the past, I definitely feel your pain on this one, right? Um, and what playful design, incorporating that, has taught me to, is to obey principles and not structures uh, first and foremost. And these principles of play are the, one of the ones that goes in right into the definition is that it's voluntary. You don't, you don't enter into play because someone's telling you go into this structure. You, you might have fun, 
but that's because you bought into it and you started doing it. So when people are very reticent, it's often because they're, they're, they're feeling forced into something. Um, this, this, not a, this is not everybody's mm. case, but uh, if you're keeping the idea of, well, this is a creative thing, uh, you're, you've got a lot of freedom, they're not being required to do an output, they may buy in naturally a lot more because they're doing things voluntarily. So the idea of keep play buy-in, you get buy-in for free when they get to express themselves, for instance, or when they get to do the other things that are in that list of uh, ways to have fun, right, those play aesthetics. When people connect with that, they go do it. People who are who are sitting off in the corner reading a novel um, and not participating is there because that's quite a lot more fun and engaging for them, right? Because they're, they love the strict, they love the narrative, they love being told the narrative, escaping into a fantasy world. Why, why are they not doing that in the classroom instead? <laughs> Not everybody's yeah, cup of tea. Yeah. What, what I'm trying to say. Elaborate. What sort yeah. of ball is it? Elaborate, please. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like that that's what maybe a particular student enjoys doing. Mm -hmm. How do I get a student like that? I'm not saying I've got one or anything, but how do you get kids like that who are very physical, mm. who really probably have low self esteem, who don't like being in the yeah. It's like the punk, the punk culture. Yeah, like part, of it's, part of it's identifying not the thing I like kicking balls over a fence, but why is kicking a ball over a fence fun for them? You know, and if you, st if you start looking at those models of fun, you might be able to say, oh, well, that's kind of the, the, the little thing in the back of their head that says, oh, I'm going to kick that ball over that. They like attacking other people, for instance. They like competing quite a bit. So if you put those Make students, and I've always higher. had great success with tough students putting them in a competitive atmosphere because they like it. I always try to take a step back and go, maybe I can't solve everything. Maybe yeah. I can't solve everything with games. Yeah. You know, and and True. sometimes you have to, otherwise you do just get overstressed because sometimes you mm. can't fix it. Yeah. But, then but, this, but that's you just try me. Too hard. Yeah, and essentially in our hard. classrooms, the students need to be able to connect and it then needs to make some kind of value connection about what they actually believe and make sense of the world. Mm. All right, we're bang on. Oh, well, one minute over, according to my iPad.